quiescent endothelial cells upregulate fatty acid beta oxidation for vasculoprotection via redox homeostasis. Well, well, don't mind if I do. Unless you're a mannequin, you have arteries that allow blood containing oxygen, nutrients, and so much more across your entire body. And you better believe it, those arteries are very much alive in their own right. If they're not healthy, you typically have increased risk of stroke, plaque buildup in your arteries, and just an overall increased mortality risk. So, why? And how do we fix it? The reason comes down, at least in a major way, to these cells that line your arteries called endothelial cells. Endothelial cells control the expansion and shrinking of your arteries, reducing and increasing blood pressure through the release of molecules that interact with nearby cells, and they do so much more. For now, just know that healthy endothelial cells are critical to good health, especially in relation to cardiovascular health. Unfortunately, aging and general insults like smoking, poor diet, lack of exercise, and so on can lead to endothelial cell stress. And one sign of that stress is proliferation. Said differently, the cells begin multiplying. That's a problem because these cells, as you can see from the images, are tightly packed together and they create this barrier which prevents things like immune cells from invading into the subendothelial regions and generally creating a pro-inflammatory environment. In their healthy functional state, endothelial cells are in their quiescent state, a non-proliferative state. In this quiescent state, they rely on fat for their energy needs. And if they become perturbed, like with the loss of the barrier integrity, they switch to a more glycolytic or carbohydrate sugar metabolism. In fact, we can see that here. In this experiment, the researchers assessed what metabolism the endothelial cells were utilizing when in a proliferative stage, akin to stress in this context, and in a less proliferative stage, like in quiescence. You can see there's a direct relationship between the downward trend of proliferation in line with the reduced glycolysis, as well as increased fatty acid oxidation, so that's fat metabolism. You don't see it yet, but that shift is extremely important for one, understanding the health of your arteries, and to also two, how to convince these cells to stay in their quiescent state. In fact, that metabolic switch from carbohydrate metabolism, the glycolytic, to the fatty acids, so fat metabolism, is also shown here in a different, crucial way, as you'll soon realize. We're looking at two critical proteins involved in carbohydrate metabolism, so glycolysis as well as fat metabolism. So we're looking at the amount of each protein found in these endothelial cells over six days as the cells transition, like we saw previously. In fact, here's the previous data again. Notice that as the fatty acid oxidation, so fat metabolism, increases, so does the CPT1 protein, indicated by darker splotches. On the other hand, as CPT1 increases, PFKFB3 decreases. Why does any of that matter? Well, it matters because CPT1 is located inside the outer mitochondrial membrane. Yes, those organelles that produce cellular energy, the powerhouse of the cell, as some might say, it is responsible partly for allowing fat molecules into the mitochondria to be metabolized for usable cellular energy. So it makes sense that the cells would be producing more of it as fat metabolism increases. On the other hand, PFKFB is an enzyme that produces, among other things, activating molecules for glycolysis, the carbohydrate metabolism. Specifically, it activates an enzyme called a phosphofructokinase, PFK. In doing so, it allows carbohydrate or glucose metabolism to work. Again, it makes sense that it might decrease based on what we know. But while we understand now that there's a relationship between metabolism and its quiescence, or in the negative scenario, increased stress and proliferation, why do the cells prefer fat metabolism? Well, for that, we have to dive deeper into the powerhouse of the cell and look at what happens to carbohydrates and fats when they undergo metabolism, because here is where we get answers. Now that the researchers know the proliferative or stressed endothelial cells have more glucose, carbohydrate focus, and the quiescent, healthier cells are more fat focused, they used labeled fat molecules to track what happens to the fat molecules as they enter the TCA cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle. Maybe you know it from that one, that second one in your biology classes. So here they're measuring citrate levels, which is produced at 
one of the earliest steps of the TCA cycle as either glucose from glycolysis or fat from beta oxidation, so that's fat metabolism, comes into the TCA cycle. There's some uh, details here that I'm keeping out for brevity, but this is in basic terms correct. So on the left, we have our proliferative endothelial cells, and on the right, we have our quiescent cells. As labeled fat molecules attract, we can see the quiescent cells produce more citrate. That's going to be more important soon. But at least we can see that the cells that favor fat utilize it more in their metabolism. Similarly, when doing similar experiments looking at glycolysis, there is greater metabolism in the proliferative cells. Okay, so we have more citrate, why does this matter? Well, your cells, when stressed, can generate a lot of damaging molecules like reactive oxygen species. These molecules are unstable and interact with the cellular environment around them, causing damage to the surrounding area, in and out of the cell. So citrate plays a role by being eventually converted to isocitrate, which can then be used indirectly to generate more NADPH. NADPH is an extremely important molecule in that it allows your cells internal antioxidant systems, so systems that neutralize reactive oxygen species, to function. Essentially, it gets used by a protein called glutathione reductase, which recharges a potent cellular antioxidant called glutathione which then interacts with and neutralizes the aforementioned reactive oxygen species. So without citrate, way at the beginning, you could have less recharging potential for glutathione, meaning that the cells are subject to greater concentrations of these damaging reactive oxygen species. In fact, if we look at the gene expression of some of the NADPH producing enzymes like isocitrate dehydrogenase here, there are two isoforms or versions of IDH, that's isocitrate dehydrogenase, and we have our two cells, proliferative and quiescent. Again, one isoform doesn't budge, but the second one does increase by about 40% in quiescent cells over the proliferative. And when we look further, specifically at the molecule that we want out of all this, so NADPH, we see that the quiescent cells, again, have greater amounts, a good thing here. But if you look closer, these data actually tell us something else, too. Notice the CPT1 there at the bottom? That's a knockdown experiment, meaning that the researchers have knocked down the gene expression in a rudimentary explanation of the CPT1 protein that we talked about earlier. If you knock it down so there are low levels of the protein, that's indicated by the plus symbols there. We clearly see this increase in NADPH is eliminated, indicating that either CPT1 is directly tied to NADPH or if we reduce fat metabolism artificially by stopping fat molecules from entering the mitochondrion, NADPH is affected, which makes sense considering that we might be reducing citrate. But let's take it a step further. Here we have the exact same conditions, except we're only looking at the healthy quiescent cells and we're measuring the reactive oxygen species. So the higher the bar, the worse. Again, if we have a knockdown of CPT1, there's an effect. We see an increase in reactive oxygen species, and we add a dose of these oxidizing molecules to the cells, the cells are less able to keep them down overall. This again implicates fat metabolism is likely helping these cells fight damaging molecules. All right, fair enough. But exactly how does this translate to arterial damage, cardiovascular disease, and so on? Well, for that, the researchers measured PAI1, or plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, which is a protein that inhibits the destruction of clots in the arteries. So typically, the greater concentration of PAI1 in the blood, the greater the risk of clots, which, of course, is a cardiovascular nightmare, if overabundant. So we see that the gene expression for PAI1 is increased when a stimulant like LPS is applied to the endothelial cells, but the effect is supercharged given a drug that blocks CPT1. Fun fact, I've actually used this drug in the lab before for the exact same reason. So again, without access to fat metabolism, these cells experienced increased clotting signatures in conjunction with increased cell stress. Similar data is seen when looking at inflammation, specifically immune cells like leukocytes. So fat metabolism is continuously shown to be important for keeping cells in their quiescent state, but also keeping them from encouraging a pro-inflammatory, pro-clotting state. 
Now that we understand all that, what can be done about it all? Well, there's a potent solution that the researchers uncover, which I'm excited to show you, as well as how to implement. However, before that, there's something else that the endothelial cells do called cellular compensation, along with a fascinating signaling cascade within the cells called notch signaling, along with ways of improving CPT1, that influential protein sitting on the mitochondrial membrane for fat metabolism, and even some specifics getting into the solutions. All of that, a ton of cell biology and applicable information is part of the extended version of the video that you're currently watching, included for the Physionic Insiders. That doesn't even mention all the perks like a private podcast, vast library of exclusive videos and articles, protocols and guides, live sessions with me and more. Check it out. I put a lot of work into it and the insider community is really great. Link is in the description. So what is the solution here? How do we protect our endothelial cells and protect our arteries by keeping them quiescent? The answer is here. Here, we're measuring those reactive oxygen species. So the lower the bar, the better. We have the CPT1 knockdown like before. We have the stressor applied to the cells, so LPS. And we have, dare I say, a solution, acetate, a short chain fat. We again see a lack of fat metabolism, assumed increases reactive oxygen species. That's not news to us veterans. However, when adding acetate, that increased level drops back down. But how is acetate, a fat molecule, doing that if CPT1 is still knocked down? Remember, for fats to enter the mitochondria, they have to engage with CPT1, and acetate is a short-chain fat. Well, that's because short-chain fats can diffuse across the mitochondrial membrane without the need for CPT1. That is not the case for most other fats, as we've described. So, either you can bypass CPT1 through a short-chain fat like acetate, or you can improve CPT1's function, which I'll get into in the extended version of this video. Now, similarly, measures of immune cells identified by the proteins on the cell surface, like CD45, are also reduced with acetate administration. Now, we have multiple measures that indicate acetate can help quiet and the tumult inside the endothelial cells. But that leaves us with a final question. Where do we get acetate? Now, granted, all these data are in cells and some in animals, but many of the experiments are in human cells. And there's long-term data that sources of acetate that we're about to get into that show effects at improving cardiovascular health. So while this is quite mechanism focused, we have some clinical data indicating benefit. So our body produces acetate, but we can increase it. For one, metabolizing alcohol in your liver leads to acetate, but let's not pretend like pounding beers is suddenly going to help your cardiovascular system. The major source is from your intestinal microbiome, the bacteria, the viruses, and so forth in your intestines. As a result, we can increase your acetate production and absorption by simply eating more of vinegar-based foods like pickled vegetables, uh, fermented tea, and another big one is dietary fiber sources like legumes, artichokes, leeks, whole grains, and anything of that ilk. These resistant fibers are taken up by bacteria and converted to acetate, which is then absorbed by your colonocytes in the intestinal wall, which pours them into the bloodstream. And guess what's waiting there to suck that acetate into their receptive mitochondria? That's right, your endothelial cells. So all that to explain an incredibly dynamic nature of your endothelial cell health through metabolism. Stressed endothelial cells tend to be linked to glycolysis or glucose metabolism, and healthier quiescent cells rely on fat metabolism. You can support that fat metabolism through consuming acetate encouraging foods like vinegar-based foods, fermented foods, and dietary fibers. Speaking to that last one, I actually go over more on fibers and their impact on your health. Allow me to fascinate you right here too. I'll speak with you over there. Thanks for tuning in.